A couple of videos ago, I promised I would give you an update about the loss of our dog. Well, we got a new dog. She's a seven month old Corgi and she turns into a Velociraptor twice a day, attacks and chews on anything in front of her. But she's quite cute as you can see. I'll let her get back to rampaging around her house and get to the question for today. What happens when a parable goes rogue? Or should I say, when we read and apply it in an inappropriate manner? Can I get down? Okay, here you go. Don't chew up anything. The history of a passage's interpretation teaches us a great deal about how and why we should interpret the Bible in the way we do. And the parables are not exempt from this. I like to compare the history of interpretation to a road map. You know the old fashioned ones where you really get to see the lay of the land. Now I've got a map here that I thought was really worth something. In fact, I took it into a map collector's office because it's a map of the state of Colorado from around the turn of the century. But it turns out that this version was done in 1957 when the state of Colorado was updating their maps. This was a provisional base copy that they were making the new map off of. Some roads will get you where you want to go quickly and fast. Others take the scenic route and some are dead ends. And some biblical interpretations are very insightful. Some are beautifully bounded like Jones's book on the art and the truth of the parables. And some are just dead ends exegetically. They are literally dead ends. And that's why I want to look at today how our reading of a parable can go horribly wrong. And we're going to look at the wheat and the tares in Matthew 13. So let's take a look at the parable of the wheat and the tares to get started. He presented them with another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a person who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. Now the weeds there is where we get the word tares from. When the plants sprouted and bore grain, then the weeds also appeared. So the slaves of the owner came and said to him, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Then where did the weeds come from? And he said, An enemy has done this. So the slaves replied, Do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, since in the gathering of the weeds you may uproot the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. At the harvest time, I will tell the reapers, first collect the weeds and tie them into bundles to be burned, but then gather the wheat into my barn. So let's jump back to the first 300 years or so of the church. Perhaps the greatest threat they faced was that of heretical teaching within the church from their perspective. We always tend to think of it as persecution from the Roman authorities, but when you read their writings, far more space and attention was given to the challenge they faced from those who didn't hold to orthodox doctrine. And just to let you know, the dog's running around down here, so I gotta keep an eye on her, lest she chew up a cable or something like that. You never know what a puppy's gonna do. Now Tertullian, who lived from about 155 to about 220 AD in Carthage, North Africa, is a good example of this. For him, the parable of the wheat and the tares taught that just like the good seed came first, so the teachings of Christ and apostolic preaching preceded that of false teachers. The early church didn't have the power of the state behind it. In fact, it was in danger of being persecuted by the Roman Empire. So to take action against those who spread false teachings or had ideas contrary to their own was just not something that was in the cards for them. Origen, who lived shortly after Tertullian, followed his readings pretty closely. The only difference is that for Origen, the good seed doesn't refer to Christ's teachings, but to the children of the kingdom of God. They were sown by God's word. The tares are evil ideas sown by the devil. Oftentimes, the early church connected the parable of the four soils that comes right before the parable of the wheat and the tares in Matthew 13. So, for example, Chris Ostenum, taught that the wheat and the tares explain what happens to the good seed at the end of the parable of the four soils. Even the good seed that produces 30, 60, and 100 fold suffer loss as the seed grows up. This seed suffers loss because tares are sown in that crop as well. 
And then the parable of the mustard seed that comes right after it shows that even though the message may start off small, it will grow to an amazing result in the end. This brings us to one of the key people in the interpretation of this parable, Augustine of Hippo, who lives around 350 to about 430 AD. With Augustine, this is where the interpretation of this parable gets interesting. In his 23rd sermon, Augustine focuses on the parable of the wheat and the tares. His sermons on the parables follow sort of a pattern. First, he explains the literal meaning, then the allegorical meaning of the parable, and then he closes with a moral or spiritual exhortation or charge. In his interpretation of the parable of the wheat and the tares in Matthew 13, Augustine follows the church fathers in linking this parable with the parable of the four soils. From Augustine's perspective, the three seeds in the first parable, the seed that fell by the road, the seed that fell on stony ground, and the seed that fell among the weeds are similar to the tares that are sown in this parable. Jesus is referring to the same thing by different names. His conclusion is, is that we must be the good seed, the good ground. We must prepare our lives for the day when we will be gathered into the barn rather than being burned up like the tares. It would have been great if he stopped there, but he didn't. One of the greatest challenges that Augustine confronted was that of the Donatist movement in North Africa. Donatism was not just a schism within the church, but it was also a civil conflict in Carthage and other cities in North Africa. In his attempts to suppress the Donatist movement, Augustine used a carrot and stick type approach. On the carrot side, he taught that the best way to deal with schismatics and heretics was to reach out and love. But what if that fails? The stick was compulsion. Now what he does is he links this parable with the parable of the great feast in Luke 14, where the master sends his servants out to invite everybody. Most people refuse. So then he sends them out to find the people along the highways and the byways, and he tells them to compel them to come in. Now for Augustine, the people living rough along these roads represented the heretics and schismatics, the Donatists. In particular, the master instructs his servants to compel them to come in, compelle entare in Latin, urge them to come in. Now, Augustine interprets that not as an invitation or exhorting or encouraging them to come in, telling them how great the feast is, but by the use of physical force. Now, doesn't this seem to conflict with the way he reads the parable of the wheat and the tares? Well, he performs several mental gymnastic moves in order to avoid this. First, by the time Augustine has come along, the Roman Empire is now sort of Christian in its orientation and leadership. So Augustine appeals to the cooperative relationship between the church and the civic authorities. Second, he goes back and reads what he considers fine print in the parable of the wheat and the tares. And what he thinks is that as long as there is a chance that some of the wheat might suffer harm when the tares are pulled out, they should not be disturbed. But once the wheat is firmly rooted and there's no danger to them or it's minimal, then severe discipline can be exercised against these tares or these heretics. What's interesting is that Augustine is often referred to as one of the four great fathers of the Western Church, the other three being Ambrose, Jerome, and Gregory the Great. But when it comes to how he interprets the parable of the wheat and the tares, and especially the use of the compel them to come in from the parable of the great feast, no one really follows his interpretation for the next five to 600 years. I don't believe this. How did you get this off my desk? I turn around for one second and she has chewed the C off my coffee time. Last week when I had her down here, she chewed up a microphone, a heart rate monitor that I have, and several cables. She probably did over $200 worth of damage, but she's still worth it, I think. Are you? 1000 AD. Up until around 1000 AD, most of the church interpreted the tares as a reference to heretics, like most of the early church did. And like Chrysostom and Jerome, they taught that they should be left alone 
because some of the wheat might be damaged if any attempt was made to uproot the tares. As a result, there was a great deal of toleration within the church concerning the treatment of heretics during the early medieval period. This all begins to change around 1000 AD, or what I like to call Y1K. During this time period, there was a perceived spiritual unity both inside and outside of the church in Europe, a sense of cultural and spiritual Christendom that unified European society. Heretics, or those who believed otherwise, were not just seen as a challenge within the church, but as an existential threat that could rupture the very foundations of society. In order to address these perceived threats, civil and ecclesial leaders began to ask how they should address these challenges. Into the midst of this wanders an individual that I bet most of you have never heard of, Watso of Liège. He lived from around 985 to about 1050 AD. Now, Watso was a gifted theologian, teacher, and leader who was the bishop in Liège, Belgium from 1041 to 1048. Under his leadership, the cathedral school in Liège grew to be a major educational center within Europe. Watso is key for our study because around 1040, before he became bishop, his bishop, Roger, the Bishop of Cologne, wrote to him about how they should handle peasants falling under the teachings of what he called the Manichaeans. Roger was concerned that they were being led astray and as a result were committing blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Their false teachers promoted the idea that the gift of the Holy Spirit was given through the laying on of hands and almost unbelievably, these people were vegetarians. I always knew there was a reason why vegetarians couldn't be trusted. Rogers was concerned that if something was not done, this heresy would spread. And in order to stop this, should the church turn these heretics over to the secular authorities for execution? Watso replied by citing the parable of the tares. The church should let dissent grow within orthodoxy until the Lord comes to separate and judge them. Christianity, according to Watso, demanded toleration of the heretics. Although Christians may seek to combat heresy, it must be done through conversation and teaching rather than by the spilling of blood. Now what's interesting is that he appeals to Augustine's interpretation of the parable of the tares that taught tolerance, not Augustine's later view regarding the use of compel them to come in. For Watso, the field was the world, Jesus was the sower, the good seed are true believers, the tares are the children of the devil, and the harvest is the end of the world. According to his interpretation, the role of clergy can be compared to the servants who want to weed out the tares, but are restrained by the master. The role of the clerics is to bring people to eternal life, not bring about their earthly death. Now, just as a side note, what's interesting is that some people were identified as heretics because they had pale skin. Blonde hair and blue eyes and a light complexion was not in vogue in those days, I guess. But I digress. They believed that being a vegetarian gave you a pale complexion. And because the heretics taught that you should not eat meat, you can see the logic here. You have a pale complexion. We know that you're a vegetarian because you have a pale complexion. Vegetarians are heretics. Therefore, you are guilty of heresy and we're going to condemn you to death for it. Watso's biographer Anselm wrote about this. Through error, coupled with cruelty, many truly Catholic persons had been killed in the past. Now, about 200 years after Watso, Pope Gregory IX instituted the papal office of the Inquisition to combat heresy in 1231. By 1300, heresy was considered a capital offense in almost all of Europe. Now, it's against this backdrop of the views on heresy and the office of inquisition that Aquinas' interpretation of the parable of the wheat and the tares really stands out. In the Catina Aurorae, or the Golden Chain, sort of a compilation of early church fathers and interpretation of texts, Aquinas identified the tares as heretics. 
Like Watso, he starts off by citing Augustine's view on the tares and the wheat and that they should grow up together so that the wheat will not be harmed in an attempt to remove the tares. However, Aquinas takes an abrupt turn from his contemporaries at this point. This was at first my opinion, that no man was to be driven by force into the unity of Christ. But look at how God compared Paul to come into the kingdom through bodily affliction. Aquinas then goes on with Augustine's view that when there is no danger of harming the weak, the tares should be rooted out. It is at this point that he adds an interesting caveat to the interpretation of the parable. When he referred to the tares, he said that we need to distinguish between heretics and infidels. Heretics were people inside the church who had wandered from the truth. Infidels referred to those outside the church. For him, the parable of the wheat and the tares referred to the church. The tares were infidels, those outside the church. In regard to them, conversion was voluntary and should not be forced. However, once a person embraced the faith, they were under obligation to keep it. If someone abandoned the Orthodox teachings and was publicly known, and there was no danger to the church if they were removed, then they could use physical compulsion against them. While this shift may seem inconsequential at this point, the conclusions that Augustine draws from them are really quite profound. If a heretic refused to return to the Orthodox position, they should be first excommunicated from the church and then handed over to the secular court. He writes, As for heretics, their sin deserves banishment, not only from the church by excommunication, but also from this world by death. The church was responsible for determining who was a heretic and the state for executing them. With Aquinas, the medieval church's concept of dealing with infidels, heretics, and schismatics reached its most articulate position. The enduring reception of Aquinas' interpretation of this passage is demonstrated by the fact that even as late as the 16th century, his work was still being cited in inquisitional trials. In the trial of a man named Calais de Pere in 1556, he appealed to Matthew 1330 on this parable. In his defense, he says, why do you not let me grow into the harvest? To which the examiner replied, because the master of the field gave this command to his servants, lest they hurt the wheat and pull it out along with the tares. But I can skirt along the edge of the field and pluck out one or two here and there, sometimes six or eight or even 12, and sometimes a hundred without hurting the wheat. The Reformation. According to Martin Luther, since faith was a free act of volition, the use of force was simply inappropriate. In fact, the manner of compulsion can only be referred to the conscience and is inner and spiritual. Calvin, on the other hand, does not follow Luther's view. For him, civil authorities may punish heretics to the full extent of the law. In this way, he followed Augustine's views. Calvin wrote, What are you doing back there? Calvin wrote, I do not disapprove of Augustine's frequent use of the passage against the Donatists in order to recommend that godly princes may lawfully issue edicts to force the obstinate and the rebellious to worship the true God and maintain the unity of the faith. Although faith is voluntary, nevertheless we see that such means are profitable for the breaking of their stubbornness, who unless they are forced, they will not be obedient or submit. Now, as a child of the medieval worldview, Calvin believed that force could be used to maintain the unity of faith. And following Augustine, he argues that the church was responsible for discipline and teaching within the church. However, outside of the church, godly authorities and princes wielded the sword. Inside the church, Christians should extend toleration to a certain extent. Outside of the church, civil magistrates were under obligation to repress error. I want you to know that having to watch over this dog, not destroying our house and eating everything in sight has really slowed down my video production. Where was I? Back to Calvin. 
When Calvin expounded the parable of the wheat and the tares, he makes a distinction between the morals and teachings. People with questionable morals must be endured. However, those who hold to or teach wicked errors and corrupt the purity of the faith are not to be tolerated. As the parable teaches, until the harvest at the end of the world, Christians should labor to purify the church primarily through teaching and exhortation. But that doesn't mean the church can't appeal to civil authorities to restrain what he calls wicked men. Contrary to the Anabaptists during the Reformation period, Calvin felt that it was a mistake to remove the power of the sword from the church. If the Anabaptists, for example, held to excommunication, Calvin argues, why couldn't the civil magistrates use the sword against these same people? This brings us to the New England colonies. Yeah, we're just about done here, okay? Once again, after Calvin's day, the use of the parable of the wheat and the tares to justify persecution really faded away in Europe. However, it resurfaces again in the New England colonies almost 100 years later. Now, I'm going to have to be rather focused here in what could be a much longer video, so I'm going to give my attention to two individuals, Roger Williams, who lived from 1603 to 83, and John Cotton, 1585 to 1652, two very, very important individuals in the establishment of the New England colonies. Now, Williams and Cotton both read the parable of the wheat and the tares from opposite directions. Roger Williams understood that Jesus' teaching in the parable of the wheat and the tares advocated for extreme religious liberty, especially for his day. This is why the tares were to be left alone until the harvest. He was well aware of the opposing views and claimed that such a misreading led to the spilling of the blood of thousands. John Cotton, on the other hand, saw the field in the parable as not referring to the church, but the world. And when he interpreted the parable, he made a careful distinction like others before. The tares were hypocrites within the church. This is why the tares looked like the wheat when they were first planted. By contrast, heretics and deliberate sinners are easy to spot compared to faithful Christians. Ministers within the church, according to John Cotton, should warn and correct these people. But if they refuse to repent, then they should be excommunicated. And if they still persist and they influence others, then the state should use the sword to cut out this infection within society. Now, he is partially responsible for the banishing of his compatriot, Roger Williams, from the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1635 for sedition and heresy. Hey, you being good? You want a treat? I know, we're just about done here, okay? Have to multitask here these days. Perhaps the most infamous event that occurs during this period is the trial of a certain Anne Hutchison. Now, Anne and her family immigrated from England, where her father, who was an Anglican cleric, was imprisoned for two years for heresy. After her father's death, her and her husband attended St. Botiful's Church in Boston, England, and she became one of the most adamant supporters of a certain John Cotton, who was minister there. Now, in 1633, John Cotton was removed from his ministry in Boston, England, due to his puritanical teachings, and he was threatened with imprisonment. Shortly after this, he fled to New England, and Anne Hutchinson and her family followed behind to stay under his teachings. In Boston, in the United States, she would hold gatherings in her house to study and discuss Cotton's sermons from that week. However, her views were characterized as being antinomian or against the law. She was accused of criticizing other Puritan clergy of preaching a gospel of works versus a gospel of grace. And to make a long story short, she was tried and convicted of heresy. Even her hero and mentor, John Cotton, condemned her as a heretic and instrument of the devil during her trials. According to Cotton's reading of the parable, she was a woman not fit for society. After a lengthy trial and detention for six months, her family was to be excommunicated and they were to lose their property, be disenfranchised from the Massachusetts Bay Colony. 
She was able to follow her husband, though, to the Rhode Island colony where Roger Williams had issued an invitation for them to come. Let's return to Roger Williams. When he interpreted the parable, the field was the world, not the church, and the church was a field of good wheat planted within a world that had tares. As a result, believers should learn to live with others within their society. When the landowner in the parable says, let them alone, don't pull out the tares, it means that neither clergy nor civil authorities should persecute those who hold different beliefs than theirs. For Williams, the parable was a strong message about liberty regarding what one believes, acts, and does. This was a radical position to the Puritan founders and leaders. And to hold this view, it required his getting a charter for the colony of Rhode Island after he was banished from the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And even though he didn't agree with Quaker theology, for example, he allowed the Quakers to freely worship in Rhode Island, even though other colonists wanted to see them imprisoned, fined, burned, or even executed. One thing that we can be very thankful for, though, is that in the long run, William's view won out. In fact, Thomas Jefferson's views on the concept of the separation of the church and state, which was built into the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, was to a large extent built upon William's views and Anne Hutchinson's experience. Now, this has been a very fast journey across the historical map of how the parable of the wheat and the tares has been interpreted. I think there's a couple of key points to take from this study. First, the history of interpretation is not something nebulous, fluffy, and just for academics, but it's crucial that we understand it because it influences our beliefs and actions today. Second, some interpretations can be very insightful and productive, like Roger Williams' interpretation of the parable of the wheat and the tares for American civil society. And this should help us to see the importance of religious liberty and what we believe, and also the separation that we need to have between the church and the state. Finally, how some interpretations are literally dead ends. We need to be very careful and guard against these, especially if you're rather pale of complexion. Until next week, I'm gonna leave you with the word of peace.